Good morning, everyone. Can everyone, can everyone hear me? OK. Um, good morning, and welcome to uh, what's going to be a fairly intimate con uh, conversation on uh, opportunities for impact investors in South Asia and um, East Africa. We have, um, we have a great panel this morning of three investors, each of whom has um, significant experience uh, investing in either one or both of these regions. And so if you're an investor um, who's considering these markets, this is your opportunity to hear from active investors what they think um, are the exciting prospects. And if you're an entrepreneur, you know, this is your chance to hear from investors what they think is exciting and potentially what they don't think is as exciting. Um, and so before we get started, just um, a little bit of, um, little bit of background. Yes, it's right there. Just a little bit of background before we get started. Um, you know, one of the things that the Gin does a lot of work on is research on the market opportunities and market trends in impact investing. And while there's a growing body of research on impact investing at the global level, um, there's still a lack of research, detailed research at, on impact investing at the regional or the country level. And so we thought it would be valuable to take a closer look at that. And so for the past uh, one and a half years, we've been working on conducting landscaping studies of the impact investing markets in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. Um, DFID, the um, UK Department for International Development, is, uh, has been a great partner of the GIN for several years. And uh, it's thanks to their generous support that we've been able to conduct this research in uh, both of these markets. So far, we've completed studies in East Africa and South Asia, and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today. Um, we've got reports focused on West Africa and Southern Africa uh, coming out in the next couple of months. Um, we worked with two uh, excellent research partners in these regions. In South Asia, we worked with the Dalberg uh, office in India um, to map the industry in six countries in South Asia. Um, and in East Africa, we worked with the Open Capital Advisors team uh, based in Nairobi um, to map the industry across 11 countries um, in East Africa. Both of these reports, including detailed country chapters, are actually available for individual download on the GIN website. Um, if anyone's interested in printed copies of the executive summary of both of these reports, I have several up here, and you can come and um, get one from me at the, um, at the conclusion of this, um, of this panel. Before I hand it over to the, to the panelists, I just wanted to provide a couple of brief highlights from the research that we conducted. So what do we find? I think the, the first thing to note is that you know, we found robust and growing impact investing markets in both South Asia and East, and East Africa. We worked with, um, I think the slides are switching. OK. We worked with our research partners to build very detailed databases of impact investing transactions um, in both of these regions. Um, we went back as far as 10 years to try and capture all the impact investing transactions that have taken place. We may not have got all of them, but I think we got a significant uh, proportion. Um, and what we found is that you know, there are at least 130 investors, impact investors, have deployed capital in South Asia um, over the past decade, and about a little over 150 in East Africa. Um, in terms of volume, $830 million uh, approximately has been deployed in South Asia um, and $1.4 billion, $4 billion approximately um, in East Africa. It should be noted that these figures exclude the investments made by development finance institutions or DFIs. Um, DFIs uh, uh, on their own have invested roughly $8 billion um, in each region. And you know, we separate the two, of course, because DFI investments are naturally quite, quite different in nature. Um, typically tend to be large projects and uh, more mature uh, companies that they, put, that they invest in. DFIs also play a very critical role in both regions, uh, supporting the ecosystem, uh, advocating for policy changes, uh, regulation to support investment, uh, and they've also uh, actually acted as anchor investors in a lot of impact investment funds operating in both South Asia um, and East Africa. 
If we look at it by country, uh, in uh, South Asia, not surprisingly, uh, India is the largest market. Those sizable volumes of capital have been deployed in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Uh, in East Africa, Kenya uh, is the largest market and then uh, significant volumes of capital in uh, Tanzania and Uganda as well. We also took a look at how this um, capital has been deployed by sector and again, perhaps not surprisingly, Apologies for the slides moving around. Um, again, perhaps not, not surprisingly, financial services um, was the most popular sector, though um, impact investors have also been active in energy, um, healthcare, housing, um, and other sectors. Um, TFIs, for their part, have also focused on financial services and energy, though the approach that they've taken has been, has been different. So for example, in the financial services space, TFIs have often invested in commercial banks, and then encourage them to on-lend to SMEs, so to tackle the financial inclusion problem top-down, um, whereas other impact investors have focused on startups and microfinance institutions um, to address the financial inclusion challenge bottom-up. And similarly, in the energy space, DFIs have focused on large-scale energy projects. Um, other impact investors have focused on startups that are providing off-grid solutions, uh, renewable energy solutions to those populations that don't have um, access, to, uh, access to the grid. And so, while we've seen obviously significant activity and growth in these markets, um, the need remains significant. Uh, both South Asia and um, East Africa uh, have large populations, um, uh, very um, significant socioeconomic challenges, and the opportunities for impact investing and social enterprise to play a role um, remains, uh, remains huge. And so, that's what's going to be the focus of today's discussion with these panelists is really to talk about what are the opportunities for impact investors and social enterprises um, in these regions. In the interest of time, I'm not going to provide lengthy introductions, but just very quickly, um, we have Maya Parengel, who is one of the four um, founding partners of Elevar Equity. Um, Elevar is um, one of the uh, you know, well-known and more successful impact investing funds um, operating in India. Um, they also invest in um, various Latin American markets. Um, we have Kayleen Alvarez from uh, Indigo Social Finance, uh, and Kayleen has uh, many years of experience, 10, 15 years of experience, helping SMEs in emerging markets um, raise capital from, uh, from impact investors. Um, and then we have Vikas Raj, who's Director of Investments at um, Axion Venture Lab, um, and Vikas has significant experience in the financial inclusion space um, in India and in emerging markets more broadly. Um, and so the way we're going to structure the session today, initially, I'll have each of the panelists spend a few minutes um, describing for you their, um, their fund um, and their strategy and approach so that the audience gets a better sense for, uh, for their approach and what they think are the opportunities in their markets. I'll then ask a few questions just to dig into uh, things in a little bit more detail, and then we'll open it up to the audience for any questions that, that you might have um, for, for the panelists as well. So without further ado, let me... Um, ask Maya to kick things off. Sure. Good morning, everyone. And uh, a little known fact might be that Abilash was one of the earliest members of the Elevar team before he decided to bring his considerable strength to uh, the gin after, um, after uh, his, his stint at the Kennedy School. But so a lot of what I'll talk about, uh, Abilash was responsible for, for laying the seeds for when he was with us in Bangalore. Elevar is an early stage venture investor um, in companies in Latin America and in India. I'll direct my comments primarily to India, but they uh, uh, are resonant in, in our Latin American investing as well. We are predominantly a financial services investor, but we also invest in housing, healthcare, and education. We take our cue really from what we see as the largest needs of the low income communities that. Uh, my partners and I and, and our team spends a lot of time with on the ground. And in our first fund, we are, we're now investing out of our third fund. Our first fund was a microfinance fund. The second fund invested predominantly in what I'll call financial inclusion 2.0, which is low-income housing, payments, small business lending. And in uh, our third inter iteration, we are doing things like education finance, um, some fintech companies, um, basically moving with, with the trends that we see in the market. We make investments that are generally um, in the million to $5 million range at the outset. In India, we do invest in startups, but our startups are 
founded generally by extremely well-respected um, executives from uh, the education space, from the financial services space, ex-Citibank uh, senior people, ex-Unilever uh, types, who are dedicating their energies to building a substantial business that fundamentally serves the need of a very large customer base whose needs are not being met by the market or even by government. So we do complete startups in India. Um, we have taken companies through IPO. Uh, we have seen all of the challenges along the way, and we really see ourselves as backers of great entrepreneurs who are extremely customer-focused, delivering essential services to communities that are highly underserved. Thanks, Maya. Um, Kayleen? Yeah, so my name's Kayleen, and my perspective is sort of, as Abhilash mentioned, I've been working in emerging markets in microfinance and with SME banking for almost 20 years now. Um, as a consultant and in the field, I started as a Peace Corps volunteer in microfinance and then ended up on Wall Street. So I've sort of covered the whole spectrum. And so our investment thesis and our, our, and our business model, in fact, is focused on meeting in the middle, meeting where development and finance meet to, to move the needle. So our approach is providing debt funding for SMEs, small and medium enterprises, in the supply chain in ethical textiles and fashion in South and Southeast Asia. That sounds very focused, but that's huge. 70% of the world's textiles go through South and Southeast Asia at some point. We're also looking at micro supply chains in East Africa, Latin America, and Central America as we see ethical textiles and fashion growing globally. Our approach is debt funding. We are, we're not focusing on exits. We are in these markets to win these markets. Businesses are built from the ground up, not from the top down, and that's our approach. We're partnering with small entrepreneurs so that in three years or five years or 10 years or 20 years, the conversation about exits and pipelines will no longer be relevant. They will be there for impact investors, but more importantly, it will just be good investment. It won't be impact investment. Like I said, I come from a development background, so our approach is very much trying to solve the problem from the inside out. And I'm happy to see at this conference this year, there's a whole track on supply chain financing. Mm -hmm. Our approach with supply chain financing is that, for our, from our perspective, it gives us transparency into the supply chain, which helps with creditworthiness for clients. And it helps us build stickiness, not from a contractual perspective, because the contract says or the collateral says that you have to repay the loan, but because we're first in line and we have stickiness with the client, they want to work with us. Not only do we provide financial capital, but we also provide this connective capital that we've been talking about, making sure that the, the companies that we lend to are cleaning and greening their supply chain, and we're hooking them up with other suppliers and buyers that are trying to do the same thing. What we're trying to do is promote um, an alternative to the Chinese race to the bottom model, where inputs and labor is really what it's all about. Great. Thank you. Very cool. Is is that picture going to stay up this entire time? <laughs> um, it's a bit daunting. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a little, <laughs> a little strange. Um, so I work for, uh, for Venture Lab, Axion Venture Lab. Uh, and Venture Lab is a venture fund that invests in and supports uh, seed stage financial inclusion focused companies around the world. Um, as a bit of context, for those of you that don't know Axion, Axion is a uh, a 50-year-old-plus um, uh, microfinance investor, technical assistance provider, manager, um, and it's really been a part of the kind of commercialization of the microfinance model and really the financial inclusion uh, world uh, uh, over, the, over the past decades. Venture Lab started much more recently. We started in 2012 uh, with really the goal of unleashing startup-led innovation in the financial services space um, to improve financial access um, uh, uh, the quality of financial services and the scale of financial access. Our core hypothesis is that startups, properly funded and enabled, are primed to drive innovation in the financial services world, so we are supporting those startups. Uh, in the markets where we invest, in India, in East Africa, um, uh, it is still the case that these ecosystems are not quite developed. A lot of businesses uh, at, the, at the really early stage are seen as pre-investable, by conventional uh, kind of commercial investors. That's where Venture Lab steps in. We invest 100 to $500,000 uh, 
um, uh, usually in equity or hybrid equity uh, in, in these businesses. Uh, we come in, like I said, very early. These are businesses that usually have a product in market, some evidence that customers actually want the product, some kind of revenue, but, but usually not a lot, uh, and a full-time, highly credible team in place. Um, but that's about it. Our companies are not profitable. They usually don't have very much revenue. Uh, what they do have is a big idea for how to change financial services um, in, their, in their market or uh, around the world. Um, we come in, we, we provide capital, we also provide management support. Uh, we tend to sit on boards, we provide guidance around fundraising, uh, um, expansion, scale. Um, we also connect our businesses to the Axion network, this kind of global network of financial services providers. We also have our own in-house management consulting group that spends anywhere between a couple weeks and a couple months with our companies, uh, helping them on kind of core strategic issues. Uh, in terms of sectors, I, I think we'll, we'll talk more specifically about what we've invested in in, uh, in Africa and, and India. Um, in terms of sectors, we, we start with the thesis that there are big kind of fundamental shifts and emerging technologies that are changing the way that, um, that the underserved can access financial services. Things like cloud computing, social media, mobile, um, um, can be catalytic in, 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 um, in being kind of infrastructure upon which new financial services products are offered. So we look at those kinds of forces at work, and then we think of themes that are really utilizing those forces. So things like marketplace lending that uses uh, the internet, social media, to, to connect um, uh, new sources of capital with underserved borrowers. Um, uh, digital SME lending, kind of, call it kind of all online um, um, acquisition vetting of, of, of borrowers. New data, um, uh, new forms of customer engagement and credit empowerment. Since these trends tend to have an outsized impact on developing markets where there isn't necessarily a vested existing technology or infrastructure, um, we tend to focus on those markets. So we, uh, we spend most of our time focused on India and Asia, uh, East Africa and in Africa, um, Mexico and Latin America and, and the US. Uh, and we're about split evenly amongst those four geographies. Why don't I pause there and we can, we can go into more detail. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to see, I guess, the diversity of investment strategies and approaches just, just on this panel itself. Um, you know, we've got a mix of equity investors, um, debt investors, those investing in, I guess, the 50,000 plus range, um, closer to the half million range, and then um, 1 million to 5 million. Um, and um, uh, those that are, I guess, focusing on having an impact through reaching customers, um, those that are focused on having an impact through um, a supplier-focused model. And so, uh, you know, I think what I'd like to do is have a conversation that digs a little bit deeper um, into some of these opportunities in these regions and, and the approaches that these investors are taking and then leave plenty of time um, for you to have your, uh, ask your questions um, uh, towards the end of the panel as well. So maybe I'll start with you, Vikas. Um, you know, your, um, your fund focuses on both East Africa and, uh, and South Asia, India in, in particular. How do you, in your experience, compare and contrast these two, these two markets, and um, how do you see the opportunities being similar or different uh, in these two markets? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, there, there's a lot of similarities between these markets, obviously a lot of differences as well. Um, in, in both markets, we've, gotten, uh, we've, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how uh, we can either support uh, lenders that are providing services to small, medium-sized businesses or um, uh, in, invest directly in those lenders. So we've invested in technologies that help lenders make better credit decisions, uh, acquire uh, potential borrowers uh, cheaper, more efficiently. Uh, we've also supported actual balance sheet lending businesses. It, the, the, the difference, I think, is that in, in Kenya in East Africa, given mobile money, the kind of ubiquity of mobile money, uh, a lot of that kind of privileged insight, that... that, that, that uh, that additional bit of information that allows uh, a borrower to go from um, a potential uh, uh, real uh, loan to, uh, or from, a, from not a loan to a loan, uh, comes from mobile money. So in, in, in East Africa, we've invested in companies like uh, First Access, uh, that is uh, using credit scoring uh, models based on mobile phone uh, data. Uh, we've invested in a company called Umati Capital uh, that provides invoice discounting to agri-value chains uh, using mobile money. 
Uh, we've invested in a company called Copo Copo, which was the first uh, uh, mobile money merchant acquirer uh, for M-Pesa that is now using that information by being kind of a part of these payment flows to actually provide merchant cash advance uh, uh, financing products. So uh, it, it's solving this, this problem of a lack of information, an inability to kind of access and then build trust around these borrowers. It's often using, it, uh, uh, using mobile money to do that in some shape or form. Uh, in India, uh, it's, it, we, we've, we've been a little bit more broad, I think, with how we've, um, uh, how we've approached that same problem. So uh, uh, we have a couple investments, one of them with, with, uh, with Elevar, in direct lending businesses that instead of using necessarily high technology or new mobile money data or anything, are using just a kind of industry sector focused approach to gain that kind of acquisition and, and, and underwriting advantage. So Vartana, for instance, is a uh, lending business based in Bangalore that does uh, nothing but lend to affordable private schools. Uh, and they know that customer better than anybody else. So uh, they can develop kind of a, 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 a sector-based shorthand that makes them much better at, um, at identifying who the best credits are within that market, um, uh, bringing them on board much more quickly. We have a similar investment in a business called iFinance in Delhi, uh, they use a sector-based approach as well uh, around industry clusters in North India. Um, I'll, I'll just point quickly to um, uh, the, uh, another way that we are looking at SME finance in India, which is a business called SME Corner. Uh, SME Corner is a, is a Bombay-based um, uh, marketplace platform that connects SMEs to, uh, to lending institutions, and they play that role of adding insight and information to the SME so that they're more palatable and, 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 and make more sense to a potential lender. Great. Great. Yeah, I, think it's, um, I think it's fascinating to see how, in a very short time, investments in the financial services uh, arena have evolved to incorporate many opportunities in the ecosystem more broadly to support you know, financial inclusion through some of these payments or through technology-based um, businesses. And I think Action Venture Lab is, um, uh, is at the forefront of that. So. Um, Maya, maybe moving on to you, uh, you know, Elevar is now in its, in its third fund, um, uh, close to, I think, 10 years now since the first fund started investing. And so how have you seen the market evolve over time and, and how has your strategy changed? Uh, and I guess, what does that mean for what, you know, you're going to be focused on in this third fund going forward? Absolutely. I, I think there are uh, several overarching trends. Um, back in the 2005-ish era when we started our first fund, um, the big uh, opportunity and need was really about access. And this was at a time when um, there were uh, really, really, really what I'll call dark spaces in terms of um, customers who just weren't served at all. And so microfinance was probably the most efficient way to get access, to have that last mile connectivity and the provision of, you know, very often a fir the first formal financial service a uh, low income household might have. So our emphasis back then was in microfinance um, because my team and I are really energized and believe in um, innovation. Uh, once the landscape was set, and it started to happen very quickly in India with the number of microfinance institutions that were funded in, in that middle mid-2000s time frame, we started to look at what I'll call deeper needs. And the migration from microfinance into small business lending, into low-income housing, into starting to see how payment systems or different technologies could enhance the delivery of products and services and re reduce transaction costs became more of the focus area. I think if you fast forward and look at what is happening today, the regulators have also um, tried to keep pace with the way that the industry is changing. Um, the, the landscape in India has been reset even within recent weeks with the awarding of different types of um, payment bank licenses, small finance bank licenses, and uh, it's very natural that Axion and ourselves would look to what are the new technologies that can further deliver value, not just access, but can we understand what customers really need and where we can provide true value at a deeper level? How can we use technology to continue to lower costs by 10 times, continue to, to increase outreach, outreach by 10 times? And how do we serve new sectors that are not necessarily the individual uh, iconic microfinance entrepreneur, 
but the small businesses that are really the engines of the economy that still operate in the informal sector. So if I look at the wave of our investing in financial services, that's how it's gone. Beyond that, what financial services business models have, has done is to inform opportunities in healthcare, in education, in agriculture, and so we've started to venture beyond core financial services and look at how the learnings of how unit economics works for financial services companies in serving the poor with um, small ticket sizes, but the need for high volume, how can we adapt that and, and use those kinds of findings for m perhaps more difficult sectors to, to address healthcare, education, um, and others? Great, thanks Maya. Um, fascinating to see how, in, I think in some, some emerging markets, the technological leaps that are being made um, are you know, almost sort of avoiding certain, avoiding the path that say other countries have gone through and uh, you know, coming up with technologies that are a little bit more advanced or sophisticated to reach um, the unbanked populations. Um, uh, Kayleen, you're focused on, on a sector, I guess, um, uh, textiles and ethical textiles, which we don't often hear of as being associated with um, impact investors, and at least in our research, we didn't um, find too many examples of investments in that space. And so I think it'd be helpful for us all to learn about, you know, um, how you see uh, the attractive business models um, in this space from both the financial perspective and the impact perspective? I think for us it goes back to this middle. Uh, MSMEs have always been in the middle and we're trying to tackle that middle. We're trying to bring cohesion around financing in an industry. And the textile and fashion industry is huge um, and arguably probably one of the most outdated supply chains and industries, you've got all kinds of labor issues, environmental issues, and that kind of thing. But I think for us, really, what we saw is that supply chain financing is an underutilized tool in, in using finance to provide leverage in a supply chain. Root Capital's done an amazing job of, of doing that in the agricultural space. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel or, or work harder, just work smarter. And we see so many parallels in the supply chain for textiles and fashion, and it's such a large supply chain, we're, we're applying a model. And one of the interesting things about the fashion and textile supply chains is that it is so bifurcated. It's artisanal, and it's craft, and it's cottage, or it's these huge conglomerates. So again, for us, we're just trying to meet in the middle. We've seen some fantastic innovations in the last two or three years, or even longer. You've got indigenous with, um, with Scott, is he here? I don't know. And Mayette is, a, is an ethical fashion brand out of New York City. And even in the investing space, you've got Tao Investments now that's looking at uh, equity and tackling some of the labor issues. And we're really just seeing it come together. There's this, this shift away from fast fashion and the, all the NPR reports on the $5 t-shirt and stuff like that. And, and awareness is, is happening. You know, Patagonia's made, Patagonia's made a commitment to clean and green their supply chain. Through shareholder advocacy, retailers are being forced to have transparency in their supply chains. And we're even seeing some of the retailers now doing their own supply chain financing. So for us, perhaps it's new to the impact space, but like I said earlier, in 20 years, I hope we're not having a conversation around impact investing. It's just good investing. Building sustainable businesses that do the right thing socially and in terms of gender justice and in terms of environmental issues are just good investment decisions, and Jen's done a lot of research on that, and I think that hopefully that's a trend that's gonna continue. Um, you alluded to this in your, in your response uh, about the, the missing middle, and I think mm -hmm. both your website um, and uh, Axion Venture Lab website um, you know, speaks about the missing middle as a focus for your respective firms. We often hear about the missing middle and how it's a bit of a uh, Bermuda Triangle for, for impact investors, and so, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what both of you think um, t it takes to, you know, to make investing work um, in the missing middle. Is it um, certain types of business models, or is it more of a structuring issue, or is it something else? Maybe Kayleen will stop with you and then move to Vikas. Sure. In my experience, in working with entrepreneurs and in working with financiers, whether they be microfinance institutions or SME banks, and, and now as an entrepreneur myself, entrepreneurs building businesses, especially smaller businesses, are looking for partners. And our approach is to be a partner in helping them build their business. And I think that's kind of what's missing in the middle. So many entrepreneurs don't understand fancy debt and equity structures and 
you know, convertible structures and, and all that kind of thing. They're just trying to run a business. And so we're trying to approach them as, as a partner in that, as, as a financier and not as a bank. And I think, again, that's why we're working th through debt. Because for us, a good underwriting process is an objective look at the business. And our underwriting is very transparent and we're working with the business owners to understand the risks in their business so that they can grow good businesses. Yeah, um, we invest in a lot of, a, a lot of uh, missing middle lending businesses and um, I talked a little bit about what makes those businesses interesting uh, to us as, as investors and, and it's uh, and if you think about we, we talk a lot about Matt Harris's three-legged stool what, what, what makes uh, a, a lender kind of interesting from an investor's perspective is some kind of advantage around uh, acquisition around underwriting or around kind of access to, to, to debt capital um, Finding companies that are doing a really good job on the first two uh, is, 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 is difficult, but, 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 but those, those business models are out there. All of our companies, even if they are really exciting in terms of um, um, an acquisition advantage, an underwriting advantage, have trouble accessing debt capital uh, early on. Um, this is a particular problem in India and, and East Africa. I think our Latin America lender business, lending businesses have, have a slightly easier time of this. Uh, and it's something that we look at very, very closely when we're looking at a potential investment. Um, the same way that our businesses our, are trying to meet this missing middle gap, they are themselves missing middle businesses to some extent. You know, they are, they are startups. They don't have two or three years of a track record. They're not break even. They don't necessarily have long established relationships with lending inst local lending institutions. So banks ignore them. Those are the same way the, those banks ignore their potential customers. Um, so, so when we're evaluating a, a, a new lender, uh, we look for um, extremely credible entrepreneurs uh, that have proven in some way or another that they are going to be able, they have the grit and hopefully some of the relationships to, to at least access some debt capital early on. In markets like India, um, there's this kind of growing, it's still very small, uh, but a growing group of, uh, of kind of impact-oriented venture debt players, uh, um, entities like Intelligro and IFMR, uh, uh, it's important that our, bus our businesses or our potential businesses have relationships to organizations like that. Um, that comes from, to Maya's point earlier, that comes from uh, making sure that our entrepreneurs, frankly, are sophisticated. Um, they are... Uh, they, they, they are senior, they have banking experience themselves, um, and they can kind of get through that two to three year uh, uh, challenging period. Once you're break even and you're doing well, it's a totally different story and, and, and the capital is a lot easier to access. I know, you, might, you might have other thoughts on that too. Your team, your yeah, team. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think what the point that you made, you know, we came up a lot in our research that yeah. um, access to debt at the early stage was a significant yeah. challenge yeah. that enterprises yeah. face. And it's, it's great to see models like, like Indigo's trying to um, provide debt at that early stage and, um, and Axion you know, working with uh, venture debt providers as co-investors um, to get that, get that debt into, um, into those portfolio companies. Yeah. Um, changing tack a little bit, maybe this is a question uh, that uh, might be of interest to the entrepreneurs in this, uh, in this room. Um, Maya, all of us invested in, I think, 20, 22 uh, companies um, over the three funds. And in that process, you must have evaluated at least 10 times as, as many more. Um, and so what are some you know, common or critical mistakes that you've seen that entrepreneurs make that might be just a, you know, an immediate deal breaker um, for an investor? Sure. Um, picking up on what, what Vikas was talking about, um, management teams that are long on vision and short on execution. So what we have seen a lot uh, is that there are some brilliant ideas out there for um, different kinds of uh, you know, products and solutions and interventions that can serve a community. But um, the individuals putting forth that vision have never run a business, don't know the market, haven't come from the market, can't amass resources. And for us, the immediate, immediate um, need, and we learned this the hard way, is that the management teams that we back have to be excellent execution-oriented entrepreneurs. We, we, have, we are very afraid of young global leaders um, and people who have 
done lots of speaking engagements and won lots of awards because we find that means that they're spending more time on stage and less time running their business and figuring out their business plans. So it's a big no-no for us if you know somebody has 20 accolades to their name and they're you know 27 years old. Usually that's a red flag. Um, I would say a second thing is authenticity about the experience of the customer. It is very important for us to get an immediate sense that the management teams that we're backing have, have spent real time in the field to understand the pain points of the customers that they're trying to serve. That it's not just an ivory tower idea of how to solve poverty, but they've spent time in the rural villages or among the artisan communities or when, with the urban poor and have really um, developed a, a, an ability to talk to and understand um, the challenges that are being faced by the customers that they want to serve. Perhaps the last one I'll th that I'll mention is um, entrepreneurs who are not disciplined about the amount of capital that they think they need to address an issue. A lot of the times we find that entrepreneurs come and they have huge fundraise asks. You know, it's sort of a, a first-time company, and they want you know ten million dollars to start off, and they haven't really thought thought through what is a disciplined approach to capital allocation. What's the right amount of capital that I need to test out a model and prove certain milestones before I go to that next step? So we're big fans. We invest at the Series A, at the Series B, at the Series C. Companies doing uh, well by the Series D or E, we're, we're, we're getting out of the business. But raising, wanting to raise too much money up front and not being thoughtful about, okay, for the next 18 months, I want to prove out these five sites with my product. I need you know, $3 million for that as opposed to a $10 million ask. So those are, those are some big picture items. Great. Thanks, Maya. So a lot of, lot of heads nodding there. So uh, <laughs> glad that that res resonated with everyone. Keep your accomplishments off your CV, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. um, Kayleen, um, you know, you've, even prior to Indigo, you've spent a lot of time helping SMEs around the world raise capital. And a common theme that came up in our research a lot is investors telling us that um, SMEs in these markets are not quote-unquote investment ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that could mean that they don't have formal financial records or um, well thought through business or strategic plans. Um, and so I'd love to hear from you, from, in, from your experience, you know, what does it take for an SME manager to raise capital? And in, I think in your case, if I'm not mistaken, Indigo even lends um, without collateral or with minimum yeah. collateral. And so what gives you that comfort and what does it take? Thanks for reminding me to say that. Yes, we <laughs> are completely uncollateralized lending and we are finance first, meaning that, you know, our rates are not subsidized and it's not grant money. This is real money because for us, sustainable businesses are at market rate because providing a business a subsidy just kicks the can and so they can work for a few years and then they can't suddenly. And I think it's sort of a, a supply and demand issue, what I've seen with entrepreneurs, because it's, it's really easy for an American or a European to go into Africa or South Asia and say they're not investment ready. But a lot of it is that that entrepreneur uh, has humility, which a lot of Americans lack, and they're not just leading with, these are my numbers, these are my profits, this is my vision, I need money, I need debt, I need equity, it needs to convert, this is my ROI. And entrepreneurs in these emerging markets don't necessarily think of their businesses that way. A lot of the smaller ones in particular don't understand debt and equity structures. They're family businesses, they bootstrap everything, and they don't understand leverage. And in particular, in our case, a lot of the businesses that we've worked with have never had debt before. And so we have to help them understand all of our lending is cash flow-based lending. So we have to help them understand what their cash flows do look like and that they actually can afford a loan and a loan repayment. And the opportunity cost of capital of not taking that loan is that the business stays micro or small. And that leverage, not over leverage, but leverage can be a tool to help you build your business. A lot of the entrepreneurs just don't, they're looking to feed their families. We're talking about businesses that are really low on Pavlov's hierarchy of needs. So helping them understand how to build an empire is not something that culturally they've ever had a context for. Mm. Great, thanks. Maybe I'll ask one more question um, to all the panelists and then we'll open it up um, to the floor. Um, I think what would be interesting for entrepreneurs in this room is to try and get a sense for, you know, post-investment, um, what's the type of support 
um, or um, level of interaction that, that you have with the uh, enterprises that you, that you invest in. Um, and so maybe we can start with Maya and go this way. Um, just provide some color on how you sure. engage with entrepreneurs after you sure. invest. Um, we do not have technical assistance. We are members of the boards of the companies that we sit on. Um, I think one of the biggest value adds that we bring is that we have uh, seen the evolution of a lot of companies at this point from start to finish. So as outside of the board meetings, we have regular sit-downs and strategy sessions with the companies where they say, okay, you've had five other companies who were in our shoes, and what happened to them in month six? What happened to them in month 12? How, do you, you know, how did you articulate uh, uh, you know, the success so that they could get to their Series B? So it's really uh, a lot of strategy work. It's a lot of working on um, fundraising rounds, the timing of them, who are the best investors to bring to the table. Often that's what our entrepreneurs um, don't really have is a network of mainstream as well as impact investors that they can reach out to who would be the best investors for the company. And also, I think having a shoulder to lean on for uh, the management teams, because this is very challenging and very hard work, and we know the communities that they're trying to serve. So just having those kinds of open conversations where um, whenever there's something that's going wrong, we want to be the first person that they call. We want our CEOs to pick up the phone and, and say, this happened, um, it's terrible, what do I do? Um, and that's the kind of interaction that we have. I think for us, is the answer is we're still kind of figuring it out. Um, our businesses are nascent, and the answer is probably we're, we're really involved in what they're doing because we're helping them build a business. And we're also still trying to figure it out. A lot of our businesses need some sort of technical assistance or business advisory, for lack of a better word, in terms of monitoring and evaluation and the impact metrics, but also on ISO standards and becoming export ready, because that opens them up to other markets, which actually helps diversify their revenue and helps make sure that we get repaid. So I think we're still trying to figure out what it, exactly it is that we can provide to our entrepreneurs that help them build better businesses, and not just, not just money, but that connective capital piece. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, and I talked about this a little bit before, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about it again. The, the, so we start by sitting on boards as well, um, kind of helping at the board level uh, advise on fundraising and strategy and path to scale. Um, we also try to plug our businesses, many of whom are, are, are lenders or working with lenders, into uh, the global Axion network uh, of 60 plus microfinance institutions around the world. We also have our own in-house TA, uh, TA facility. Um, and we have 22 companies in our portfolio. Uh, we've done TA projects with 16 of them. Uh, and, and these can be projects anywhere between a couple weeks and a couple months. And it's getting in and really helping on core kind of strategic issues that management, while they're probably able to do it, just don't have time to do. So we've uh, helped on things like customer segmentation, on product strategy. That's increasingly becoming a really fundamental part of how we even think about our investing work. Um, we, we get our portfolio engagement TA team involved at the kind of during the investment process to identify specific ways that we can help out as soon as we invest. And then we get in there and, uh, and really kind of help, help our management teams deal with these, these, these important issues. And it's been quite helpful uh, so far. Great. And is this, is this TA just um, as a quick follow-up, is that provided through your in-house team or do you also engage external providers to provide TA? It, it's all in-house. And, and that's intentional. I mean, the, our, our startups are dealing with a million things uh, and, and, don't, and, and, and if we work uh, the way I think a lot of the TA world works, which is uh, uh, spending six months figuring out exactly what the project looks like and looking at timelines and deadlines and, and, and pricing it and everything like that. By the time the TA person goes and sits with the company, it's a completely different company. We, we try to have uh, our, a really nimble um, and, and, and kind of responsive TA function where we're able to identify a need and then the next week have somebody on the ground with the company helping. Right. Um, I know there's a couple of mics floating around the audience, so maybe um, we'll open it up to any questions from the audience. Back there. If you could just identify uh, your name and which organization you're with. Sure. Uh, Ivan? 
I'm George Scharfenberger with the University of, Southern, uh, University of Berkeley, uh, Master of Development Practice Program. My question is uh, kind of looking to the future, about five years from now. Kayleen uh, suggested that this is not a, something special, it's really just business as business. Where do you see this going five years from now? I mean, are, are the, the products you're providing and the way you're operating, is this a transitional uh, solution to something else, a stopgap, or is this going to be a permanent fixture of uh, these economies? Okay, so the question is, where, where do you see these markets five years from now? Um, Sure. I mean, just from the India perspective, um, a lot of what's happening is I, uh, what I'd call the formalization of the informal economy. So the businesses, especially on the financial services side um, that a lot of us are backing, are really engaged in bringing into the formal sector um, lending, uh, credit history, uh, uh, savings and insurance products, etc. So I, I feel like it's a bit of a cliche to say it's, it's an extension of the same, but the, the overarching trend is bringing the informal economy into, into the formal landscape, in my mind. And that's happening in financial services. It's happening in healthcare. It's happening in agriculture. It will happen in education as well. And Kayleen, you're just starting up, so how do you see things five years from now? Honestly, it's funny because we're certainly using technology to help in credit risk management and underwriting and, and that kind of thing. But honestly, we're kicking it old school. Lending, the products that we're doing, it's working capital, it's equipment lending, it's super simple. And so we're really kind of taking it back and that resonates with their entrepreneurs. We don't come in and, and preach some fancy structure to them, they get it. And so I think for us, we're sort of trying to get back to the basics. Great, thank you. Any, um, any other questions from the audience? Hi, um, sorry, Sapna Shah, also a colleague of Abhilash, is from the Global Impact Investing Network. Um, I was curious in this conversation about East Africa and, and South Asia uh, that much of the South Asian dialogue has focused on India. And I, I was curious um, if any of the three of you have looked at Pakistan or, or Bangladesh or I guess some of the other mar the markets in that region. Um, and if not, I guess why not? And if so, maybe what's um, sort of preventing more, more capital deployment in those countries? Sure, yeah. Um, we, we, we have not looked at, at Bangladesh closely. We've looked at some uh, uh, businesses in Sri Lanka, uh, and we've looked actually at Pakistan quite closely. So um, the, uh, we, we actually had a consultant uh, in partnership with CGAP on the ground in Pakistan for six months exploring the market for us. Um, what, what we found was that, uh, frankly, we weren't seeing a lot of, uh, of, of fundable business models and, and ready to go entrepreneurs, even at our stage. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're really seed stage investors. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting thing, things happening there, but um, the, the conclusion we came to was that it would be, it actually might be best for us to be part of more of a kind of incubator model in Pakistan uh, versus uh, supporting kind of business models that are already there and entrepreneurs that are already re really ready to manage them. Yeah, sure. I'm probably one of the most pro-Pakistan people in the room. I, I've done a lot of work in Pakistan and love it, and also Sri Lanka. I think for us, we're, it's a supply chain play, but our lowest hanging fruit is at the end of the supply chain right now in terms of risk management. So we're probably focusing on Southeast Asia a little bit more right now. And then when you get to Sri Lanka and Pakistan and India, we're at the, at the base of the supply chain with the ag stuff. And quite honestly, right now, there's huge regulatory hurdles for yeah. us in terms of being able to lend and get money out. And also, that's where you've got the state conglomerates coming in and fixing the price of cotton and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more challenging. And to be honest, we haven't yet found the right partner that's going to help us be able to go in and navigate that network right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the challenge is that um, those are the markets where really high risk capital or potentially th philanthropic or aid capital have to go because the macro political risk, um, the lack of liquidity, the challenge of getting exits um, is what keeps what I'll call um, commercial return oriented investors who, who have uh, Western LPs from going into those markets. It's, they are phenomenal, vibrant, vibrant markets and they, you know, at, from a ground up are, are just, you just want to do stuff in Pakistan because yeah. it's yeah. so awesome, but it's the macro makes it very tough. Um, we had a question here. 
Yeah, hi, good morning. Roland Pearson, Managing Director from Include. Uh, I have pretty much the parallel question for East Africa, um, which is, you know, briefly, Kenya, lovely. Uh, a bit of an anomaly, even in East Africa, uh, yeah. much less the rest of the continent. So I wanted to find out your view for the rest of East Africa um, to, you know, kind of get a sense of what you see the opportunities are and, and perhaps somewhat begging the question what the challenges are and how, how they may be overcome. Sure. sure. Um, I can give a quick answer from the research perspective and then uh, maybe Vikas has some views. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but you know, a couple of the other couple of the sectors that really came up in our research, um, agriculture came up a lot. Um, agriculture as a share of GDP has fallen drastically um, across East Africa uh, and South Asia, for that matter, over the uh, last couple of decades. But agriculture remains um, the largest employer of uh, of uh, people in these regions, and so. Um, the significant opportunity for productivity improvements in the agricultural value chain um, was something that came up a lot in our research. Um, Off-grid energy uh, was the other one that was highlighted a lot. Large segments of the population in both of these regions do not have access to the grid. Um, and so off-grid uh, renewable energy solutions um, was something that was emphasized a lot in markets such as Tanzania, um, Uganda, Rwanda, et cetera. Um, Vikas, do you look at any Sure, yeah. Well, so we actually, we have two investments in Tanzania. So two, two in uh, Kenya, two in Tanzania, in East Africa. Um, I, th I think with, you know, Kenya has obviously become kind of this hotbed of entrepreneurial activity in East Africa, largely because, I think, of, M of M-Pesa. Uh, Tanzania, with recent moves towards interoperability amongst all of the different MNOs um, is essentially building a different kind of ubiquitous mobile money ecosystem, which means that there should be uh, ultimately opportunities uh, of the same ilk as, as what we've seen in Kenya, opportunities to build more kind of cash light systems uh, like Copo Copo, uh, opportunities to provide additional financial services on top of mobile money like we've seen in Kenya with things like Umati and First Access. Um, we haven't seen a ton of new business models there yet, uh, but we're keeping our eyes open and we're really excited about that. There's also other markets outside of East Africa, in Africa, that we're getting more and more excited about. Nigeria, in particular, uh, has uh, a, a really exciting entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, um, uh, a bank-led model instead of a kind of m and led model in terms of mobile money, but one that is increasingly, uh, it, it, that is gaining traction. So uh, we're, we kind of have our eyes open in Nigeria, Ghana, and other parts of Africa as well. Thank you. I saw two more hands, one here and one here. Hi, I'm Silvana Sinha, and I just wanted to follow up on the question that was asked about South Asia as well. I'm actually a Bangladeshi um, entrepreneur. I'm raising money for a healthcare fund right now. And I have to tell you, I found it fairly shocking how much easier it is to raise money for Pakistan than Bangladesh. And that certain investors that I approach actually tell me they won't invest in Bangladesh because of political risk, when Pakistan is actually a failed state. So what can I do to overcome that? I can't, I couldn't. Uh... I couldn't hear. So you said, was the question, there's, uh, there's a bit of a... a well, uh, sorry, my is question... Is, is that what you were talking about? I don't think it's actually... Kiss the mic. Hello? Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, my question is, as a Bangladeshi entrepreneur trying to raise money, when people tell me they won't invest in Bangladesh because of political risk, how do I respond to that when Pakistan's actually a failed state? And I think it's a lot easier to raise money for Pakistan, actually. So the question is, I and, guess... Uh, Entrepreneur in Bangladesh uh, wants to raise capital, but the response she hears is yeah. um, there's a lot of political risk in the market, and so um, how does she get around that? Uh, anyone like my, Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my answer is simple. Look, when you're looking for investors, whether they're debt or equity, you're looking for partners. And if they don't understand the context of Bangladesh, then move on. <laughs> Build your business, and you don't need to teach yeah. them about how great Bangladesh is as a market. I, 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 think, I think the other thing you could do is um, have your one-page list of here are the seven successful recent examples right. um, of, you know, there, there are some in the Grameen universe, there, there are others where, where companies have been invested in and exits have happened. But realistically, in our space, um, people are pretty focused on what they're investing in. And in my mandate, the way my fund docs are written, I can only do India. So you also have to be real, realistic about who are the investors out there that might do Bangladesh. And 
you'll waste your time if you're trying to convince somebody who's not focused on the country to focus on that because it's just a it's it, it, we are limited and we are we're still a small group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Bangladesh has a marketing challenge, is what you're exactly. saying, and and I think the best the best antidote to that is being loud and clear about the successes that have come out of the country, so that when when you know when people say ah you know it's too risky, say well here 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 are examples here are live examples. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, my name is Kalpana. I'm from Delhi, India. Uh, and my question is a little different. Um, I'm actually uh, working, uh, I've recently become an entrepreneur looking at... Can you at, speak up a bit? Looking at urban safety and uh, issues of violence against women in cities in India. So I was just wondering, because a lot of the, I mean, you talked about mostly microfinance, education, health, textiles, and the more traditional, conventional spaces of investing. But what about new social problems which are coming up? Are you looking at investing in things? It's very difficult to develop a business model for us in these kind yeah. of areas, mm -hmm. but we need to, and we're looking for help. And there, it's just not us, it's just not just me, but there are many people who are looking at social problems such as youth unemployment, uh, you know, attitudes of men in India and sure. in, in Pakistan and Bangladesh and violence against women, creating safer urban spaces. I mean, the SDGs have recently brought in safe and inclusive urban spaces as one of the main SDGs out of the uh, 17. So is it an area that you're looking at at all into expanding of new social problems in urban areas specifically? Because the growth of urbanization is taking place in yep. Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to yep. have many, many more cities in these countries with huge populations, really millions, 10, 15, 20 million people. Yeah. It's a tough question to answer briefly, but urbanization and the social problems... I, I think the biggest challenge is not all problems can be addressed commercially. And you have to draw a very strong line between what's appropriate, because if you set up a business approach to a problem that does not have a commercial end to it, you're setting up for failure. And so the question is, may, perhaps there is a hybrid model there. It may not have to live squarely in the nonprofit sector, but you have to be absolutely clear that... Um, impact investing is not, you know, a tool for all, all, of, all of the important social problems. And, you know, violence against women is a, is a huge issue. Urban safety is a huge issue. I frankly haven't seen a commercial response to it. I've seen a social impact bond response to it here in the United States. So perhaps that's a model that could be followed in India that's very difficult to articulate and pull together. But that, you know, that's probably just, uh, you know, top of mind for me as, as, as a response. Great. Thanks, Maya. I think we're, um, uh, we're past time. So thank you, everyone. And a big thank you to all our panelists. Bye. Uh,